Hey, so it's 3.14 a.m., uh, July 16th, supposedly 2017. I'm hitting this one kind of early. I noticed uh, not long ago when I got up that yesterday I had done another reading on this book. They were white and they were slaves. But I had neglected to hit the publish button uh, on the uh, YouTube upload so that was just uploaded maybe an hour or two ago and i'm gonna pick right back up where i left off now honestly i i've been making videos long enough on youtube to know that well first off if you choose right from the start to be a non-monetized channel you're not going to get the exposure because <clears throat> YouTube themselves is not going to be making the money off of your channel as if you're a monetized channel and anybody who's listening to my channel long enough knows why I don't monetize my channel uh, I go out and I work with my hands hard for a living and there is no need for me or anyone else to be charging you to give you the truth there's no need at all but it does have its drawbacks because I'm not going to be put out there very much because it's not monetized uh, the other thing is uh, subject content in general isn't going to be spread too much uh, you see channels that have uh, the most spurious content pushing some of the most uh, ridiculous ideas and theories and they have uh, widespread um, recommendations and advertisements I get them still constantly on on my own personal YouTube account and I think you know why am I still getting this ridiculous stuff stuff that I have in the past I rejected over and over again uh, there have been things that um, I just can't imagine why are they still trying to shove it down my throat and I would believe it's because in at least some part those content creators are working for um, Google in some way or some agency that Google works for is owned by is run by uh, that would be my belief um, and maybe the reason that these videos, uh, they were white and they were slaves, aren't getting as many hits because maybe a lot of people are having a real hard time, uh, first off, maybe coming to terms with the fact that black slavery was nowhere near as bad as white slavery uh, in America and worldwide. Um, it looks like white slavery... Uh, possibly even topped um, the terrible black slavery that went on in Muslim countries. Any blacks that may be listening to this that in some way have a grudge against white people uh, should really look into that. It just astounds me that so many blacks would go Muslim when it is actually the Muslim Arabs that have uh, probably the least uh, respect and um, actions of human decency towards blacks the world over uh, when in fact whites have had the most uh, beneficent um, works and acts towards blacks the world over historically but it takes a long time for people to come to terms with the real truth now the same people who would admit <laughs> over and over again that history has been so fabricated in so many ways we've been lied to in so many ways but somehow when you get to this idea that white slavery was far and exceeding of black slavery they just can't hear it maybe a lot of the blacks don't want to hear it because you know that whole slavery issue from you know far far over a century ago is still their meal ticket Maybe the whites don't want to hear it because they've just been, they've just had this beaten into them for their whole lives. 
and it's just too difficult to put off that cloak of white guilt and understand what the truth is. Maybe they like feeling bad about themselves. I don't know. At any rate, for those who have uh, stuck with these readings, again, I hope you are continually empowered and, and edified, not empowered in a way to hate blacks or or anyone else uh, of any other race for that matter uh i would hate the i would hate the evil uh in men that does this both to whites and to blacks to anyone consider the fact that you know the elites that do run things whether they be mostly um uh, kazar edomite so-called Jews, or whether many be uh, Roman Catholic even, uh, the Vatican. Either way, those people who are um, running things and stirring the pot and maneuvering and, you know, that, that cause things to happen by uh, the power that they, they currently hold, they understand these things all too well. You see, those same... Uh, <laughs> those same issues that they program people with, you know, believing certain things about um, races and peoples and groups and tribes. You see, they program us with the lie while they are operating uh, with a knowledge of what is fact concerning the way races are and how they um, interact with one another. Um, this is specifically why they've been pushing this whole white guilt thing and um, black inequality and I mean the whole civil rights sham um, and the constant crying about black slavery and um, pouring um, those of other cultures that do hate whites just naturally and why do they hate whites because they're not good people that's why anybody who hates whites because they're whites they're not good people they're wicked people i don't hate mexicans because they're mexicans nor blacks because they're blacks but they hate us because the color of our skin so that makes them not good makes them wicked <laughs> And it makes them ignorant. Makes them ignorant of history. So they they pour these peoples in, crossed our border, under our noses. And they know how people are, and they know how those people are. And they know that many of them, many of those peoples, have far less a conscious conscience. Or um, they know that they are not known for... Uh, benevolent, decent actions against people of other races, or even of people of their own race. They know what people are like, and they're going to use those people <clears throat> to stop what they believe they are seeing amongst the white community in this country and other white countries where the Anglo-Saxons are being roused from their sleep. This is not something they want. Because they know that we have been peoples living in countries that have at one time or another chosen to keep the laws of Yahweh, that is the God of the Bible, chosen to have faith in His Son, Yeshua, They cannot let a people like that come to power because if that should happen, uh, that would mean equity uh, towards all peoples, not just white people, all people. And that would mean the end of their empire, their empire of greed and power. They can't have that. So they will continue to weaken this nation 
if they can't weaken it through uh, the constant stream of uh, pornography and um, transsexual Hollywood and uh, usury debt, taxation, they'll do it with other people that hate us just because of the color of our skin. That's why it's important for you, I don't care what color you are, to understand this information and to look at things the right way, to acknowledge the truth and to stand with the truth, which is Christ. Would he want you hating a people because of the color of their skin? Would he want you stealing from those people just because um, of some claims that uh, our people are evil without any evidence to back it up? The only evidence is the claim. It's all circular. All of your claims against whites, it's circular. It has no foundation in actual fact or history, like this work by Michael Hoffman II has, full of references, full of factual accounts. And these aren't just books that people wrote. He's getting tons of this stuff from public record. When you have a majority of sources that are all agreeing with the same thing over and over and over again, and you can't point to some good reason why all of those things would have been adjusted or why. I mean, look, look, here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you want to say something like, oh, well, you know, uh, somebody changed all of these sources uh, to say all of this stuff about how bad things were for the whites, uh, you know, and it was a conspiracy to do that. Okay. If it were a conspiracy to do that, it would be being used in some way by the establishment. It is not. It's been covered up, completely buried. So you got to use some common sense. Think, was it really some kind of a conspiracy to, um, to f falsify all of these public records and these books written uh, just to bury it all, you falsify it all, and bury it all. How much sense does that make? Oh, think about that. As we continue with the chapter, White Slaves Treated Worse Than Blacks. Before 1650, however, the greater victims of man's inhumanity were the mass of white Christian servants who suffered at the hands of callous white Christian masters. <laughs> of all things, Christian. For the time being, with all of their troubles, the blacks had it better. From Breidenbaugh, page 120. Sold to a master in Marion, near Philadelphia, David Evans was to put to work hewing and uprooting trees land clearing, the most arduous of colonial labor, work that was spared black slaves because they were too valuable. Van der Zee, page 138. Negroes are therefore, almost in every instance, under or more comfortable circumstances than the miserable European, over whom the rigid planter exercises an inflexible rigidity. They are strained to the utmost to perform their allotted labor. They frequently try to escape, but very few are successful and, when apprehended, are committed to close confinement, advertised and delivered to their respective masters. The unhappy culprit is doomed to a severe chastisement, and a prolongation of servitude is decreed. Those who survive seldom establish their residence. From William Edis, Letters from America, published in 1792, letter number 6. In the British West Indies, the torture visited upon white slaves by their masters was routine. 
masters hung white slaves by their hands and set their hands afire as a means of punishment. To end this barbarity, Colonel William Brain wrote to English authorities in 1656 urging the importation of Negro slaves on the grounds that, quote, as the planters would have to pay much for them, they would have an interest in preserving their lives, which was wanting in the case of whites, many of whom he charged were killed by overwork and cruel treatment. And who does not remember the, the scene from the movie Roots where uh, James Evans from Good Times is tied to a tree uh, by a bunch of, bunch of stupid backward hicks and then, of course, to punish him for all his running, they take an axe and they cut off half his foot. I'm not even sure how well documented that is, you know. But, of course, nobody's making uh, movies, writing best-selling books about the whites' sufferings uh, in the colonies whatsoever. That should tell you something. Now, the next chapter, Indentures, an Organized Racket. Even privileged 17th and 18th century apprentices often became slaves in the end, i.e. unpaid forced laborers for life, based on contractual trickery, judicial malfeasance, and usury employed against them during their supposed limited term as indentured servants. <laughs> I smell Jews. I don't know about you. I'm, I'm smelling a Jew somewhere in here. Now, such an apprentice would be enticed to borrow sums of money, sign a contract with impossible provisions, guaranteeing his or her violation of the contractual terms and other unscrupulous means of extending both the period of servitude as well as broadening the scope of the servant's obligations. By these means, an apprentice could be transformed into a slave for life, just like they do it to us today, but they've grown far smarter about how they do it to us. Uh, they do it to us through mortgages, student loans, credit cards, car payments, and the non-stop advertising brainwashing people into believing that the things that they have they should not be just satisfied with and thankful to their God for providing. That's why we're slaves today. Free white people were sometimes induced to sign quote indentures unquote and place themselves in voluntary <laughs> in quotes temporary slavery with the promise of obtaining farm acreage at the end of their term of indenture. An American colony typically offered 50 acres to such persons. This was actually little more than an organized racket. The alleged servant had his or her land grant entrusted to the land owner for whom they labored, with the understanding that title would pass to the servant at the end of his term of labor. But he could forfeit his rights to this promised land on the slightest pretext of his owner. On such grounds as running away, the owner's word would do, or for indolence. And I wonder if that was supposed to be insolence, but uh, indolence. I'm sorry, my vocabulary is not nearly as wide as the vocabulary of many people who lived a few hundred years ago, and it's certainly not as broad as Hoffman's. For the price of a white slave's transport, six pounds, his owner secured a head right, in quotes, to the land which was supposedly intended to go to the servant, 
but which was instead combined with the land supposedly set aside for other white slaves and formed into an estate which would multiply in value by this means and with an occasional additional fee to an english merchant or spirit who provided the landowner with kidnapped extra white slaves the plantation owners of colonial america played monopoly with the fertile valleys and wooded up lands of maryland and virginia meanwhile the rightful owners of this land lay in paupers graves or in shackled for life this monopolistic grip on the land market was detrimental to all white laborers you see um, yahweh's law it does not allow monopolies those white slaves who did manage to obtain their freedom after thirty or forty years as chattel were swindled out of the spectral freedom dues of acreage left to exist as landless peasants and scorned as hillbillies and white trash in spite of decades of labor under monstrous conditions of hardship one would like to think that some of the few survivors went on to become prominent leaders of the colony or were the founders of great families this does not appear to be the case some were doubtless the progenitors of the poor white trash of the south many of the free whites who had descended from the poorer elements of the white servant class became objects of charity johnson p 147 jernigan pages 56 and 178 at no time after 1640 in either barbados or st christopher and probably nevis was there any cheap land enough for a man to purchase with his freedom dues? The vast majority never became landholders. From Brydenball, page 113. It then became the custom to give the servant at the end of his term not land, but 300 pounds of sugar, worth less than two pounds sterling. It was hardly worth the servant's while to endure the conditions which have been described for four bucks worth of sugar from Aaron, eric williams pages 102 103 freed white slaves experienced hard times in a study of 145 white freedom residing in kent county maryland freed men i'm sorry 145 white freed men residing in Kent County, Maryland, quote, only five could be traced with reasonable certainty in property records for all of Maryland, including Willis, estate inventories, and debt books, which were compilations of land holdings. And among the five former white slaves who did leave an inventory of their goods, none was well to do. And, of course, we keep seeing they keep popping up, right? Virginia and Maryland, Virginia and Maryland. If a great uh, concentration of these things were being done in Virginia and Maryland, and we can probably uh, definitely speculate that uh, Barbados as well, then a lot of this, you can, you can be pretty certain that the higher-ups of uh, Rome were involved in these things. And now the thing is, I, I don't, I don't have uh, all the information in front of me showing the dynamics of the Khazars calling themselves Jews and uh, their relationships to uh, the uh, aristocracy in uh, the Holy Roman Empire. But when you look at the history and who was holding power in certain ways uh, even in a land like England which forcibly ejected the Catholic Church all of this uh, speculation over the Jesuits being Muranos and just the absolute total proliferation of these Kazarian Ashkenazi uh, non-Judahites all over the halls of power 
one has to say to themselves, okay, look, is this really the uh, Vatican's plot to put the Jew at the forefront of every uh, devious thing they're doing? Or have the Jews gained this kind of power? Um, now, it, it would make sense that the Jews would be put at the front of many of uh, the Vatican's exploits because um, it has, to my knowledge, always been uh, against canon law to uh, charge usury, for one thing. So you would use them to do this. Um, there's, there's ample um, proof that in, in many uh, areas where, let's say, a Christian lord uh, could not charge usury that um, who would be working for them would be a Khazarian Ashkenazi uh, not Jew who would be charging usury they would uh, they were very willing to get their hands dirty uh, with a lot of uh, despicable practices and with uh, little to no conscience about any of it so who is it really who's really behind the scenes well it's really difficult to say, isn't it? Uh, I think it's very obvious that the first beast of Revelation is the Holy Roman Empire. When you look at the woman who is riding the beast, and if a woman is riding the beast, that means that she is uh, controlling it uh, to a degree. No, no man can ride a beast without having tamed it or, or having control of it. That woman you see, which has been charged by many over the years to be Rome herself or the Romish church, could also be interpreted as Talmudic Judaism. And that's, of course, one of the reasons why I think it's important for more scholars who have a hunger for the truth to look into this idea that the New Testament was written entirely in Greek. If this was the case, the book of Revelation is the worst Greek uh, that most scholars are aware of. None of it really seems to add up. So anyways, this is why I keep saying those in control or those in power or the elites or something because I haven't yet seen enough information one way or the other to know exactly how the dynamics over the last three to five centuries have worked between the Khazarian Ashkenazi uh, and the, the Roman papal agent. It's a toughie. It is a toughie. And it seems like people who are of one sect or another in Christianity just choose to adopt the dogma of that sect as opposed to using their own mind and with fervent prayer and diligent study finding out the answers for themselves. I wish someone... I, I wish someone would, because uh, I don't even have the time to uh, delve into so many of these things. I really wish someone would. So really, no matter who it is at the top, or who is stirring the pot, and causing all of this tension against whites, I do have to say that if the people out there who call themselves good do not hang together and have a love for the truth and do well and love the brethren first, we will, as we have been, continue to be divided, sifted, and destroyed. We will continue to have what our hands produce stolen from us. We will continue to have the inheritance of our children taken away. We will end up a persecuted and probably 
uh, murdered and raped minority in our own countries. And for those of you who think that there's something wrong with those of European descent wanting to maintain their own countries, then you need to start railing against all of the countries in Africa and Arabia and the Orient who practice the same thing. They want to have their own countries, but somehow it's wrong for the European white to want to have theirs. A country in which they can establish Yahweh's laws and and worship and serve their Lord and King, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. It's sometimes unimaginable for me to believe that my own people hate themselves and other people with their uh, similar heritage and ways and the same God, or I'm sorry, in many cases, approximately the same. At least you affirm your belief in the Bible, whether you believe or practice it necessarily right or not. I can't even believe that sometimes. You have been so brainwashed as to hate yourself and your brother. Even your own Christian brother. Sad state of affairs. It's a sad state of affairs. What kind of world are we leaving for our children and grandchildren? Are we so selfish as to not think of them? I digress. Now, a study of all Harrow's Parish, Maryland, has shown that whereas one-third of adult white males did not own land around 1700, nearly half were non-landowners by the middle of the century. In the mid-18th century, newly freed servants trying to enter the ranks of small planters encountered severe obstacles. Besides lacking capital to buy tools, seed, livestock, few of them could afford the land. In Virginia, large numbers never received freedom dues. Moreover, in quotes, years of servitude so ruined the health, unquote, of some former white slaves, quotes, that no one would hire them, unquote, once they were free. Eckridge, page 179, 180, 182, and 183. In fact, some white slaves, out of extreme poverty, signed new contracts of indenture, contri contributing to a pattern of lifelong servitude. <clears throat> our ancestors, our people, <coughs> were stolen, which Yahweh's law doesn't allow. The, the, the man who steals another man should be put to death. Our ancestors were, were stolen. The best years of their life were worked out of them. They were worked to exhaustion for so many years that even when these aristocrats would release them with their four dollars worth of sugar they didn't have the physical well-being left to go out and make it on their own to carve out something for themselves these former white or I'm sorry, these white former slaves' share of the accumulated wealth of the American colonies, measured by any standard, was negligible. Their say in the planter aristocracy was virtually non-existent. They were the expendable byproducts and survivors of a system of exploitation governed solely by merchant companies chartered in England by aristocratic fiat it was the exclusive government by a merchant company which Adam Smith assailed as the worst of all governments for any country. Amen. 
Often working conditions were made especially gruesome toward the end of the period when the servant's contract was due to expire in order to induce him to run away, lose his fifty acres, and be held extra years in enslavement for fleeing. Quote, toward the end of the term of servitude, working conditions would often be deliberately worsened, tempting a man to run away, so the master might gain these advantages. From Kendall, page 7. Of 5,000 indentured servants, in quotes, who entered the colony of Maryland between 1670 and 1680, fewer than 1,300 proved their rights to their 50-acre freedom dues. What had become of the others? More than 1,400 died from overwork, chronic malnourishment, and disease. The others were defrauded. By the 18th century, the white servant class was disillusioned. The planters had squashed the laboring whites. They were the easy pawns of the planters who despised them. Beckles, Rebels and Reactionaries, page 18 and 19. The statutes overseeing non-penal indentured servitude in colonial America were mere window dressing, and neither these statutes or the common law proved any obstacle to the gradual enslavement of those with the non-penal status of indentured servant by means of tacking on extra time to be served on the basis of fabricated or trumped charges and minor offenses. A Virginia law of 1619 provided that, quote, if a servant willfully neglect his master's commands, he shall suffer bodily punishment. When Wyatt became governor in 1621, he was ordered to see that punishment for offenses committed by white slaves would also be in terms of labor on behalf of the colonial government, such labor to be performed after the slave fulfilled his original period of service to his master. This is the evil practice of lengthening the time required for the white person's term of labor, a practice which quickly resulted in the lengthening of the term of service, in quotes, by years and ended in the perpetual enslavement of the white. While it is true that the common law of England had the status of national law with territorial extent in the colonies, the relation of master to servant in cases of what began as non-penal indentured servitude was unknown to the common law and could neither be derived from nor regulated by it. From Richard B. Morris, Massachusetts and the Common Law, American History Review, 1926. Both indentured servitude and the white slavery permitted under the rubric of the penal codes depended for their regulation and sanction on special local statutes and tribunals which acted as the, in quotes, necessities of the occasion, unquote, demanded. The legacy of white enslavement bound up in the medieval English legal concept of villainage contributed an informal framework, or milieu at least, for legitimizing the enslavement of the white poor in British America. In this light, Richard B. Morris is only partially correct. There was in fact precedent for white slavery in common law, but it was little cited in the colonies perhaps because such formal legal citation would have exposed the indenture's racket for what it was. Biblical provisions for bound and hired labor were cited to justify white slavery in early America on the grounds that it was scriptural and therefore humane. The Body of Liberties of 1641, the first law code of Puritan New England, established four categories of servitude, citing Exodus 21 2, 
Leviticus 25, 39 through 55, and Deuteronomy 23, 15 and 16. However, had those scriptures actually been obeyed, the enslavement of Christians, the heirs of the Israelites, would never have taken place. Moreover, I add, the Israelites. Deuteronomy mandates that a bondsman is not to be oppressed. Exodus decrees that the term of service will under no circumstance exceed six years. Leviticus forbids forced slavery for the payment of debts as well as child slavery. CF 25, 40, and 41. The permanent enslavement of racial aliens and their children was permitted. Leviticus 25, 45, and 46. Exodus 21, 4, which destroys the whole basis of Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address. Then, as now, religious hypocrites of churchianity, as it more properly may be called, ignored Bible teachings on the subject, even as they cited them for purposes of their own justification in, in enslaving fellow white Christians for pecuniary gain. It should be noted that some individual masters in early America who felt convicted by the scriptures regulating bonded kinsmen moderated their treatment of white bondsmen accordingly. So we had some conscientious enslavers. Well, that's good. In colonial America, white people could be enslaved for such an offense as missing church services more than three times. <laughs> or for, well, geez, I'd already be enslaved. Or for prevention of an idle course of life. In 1640, a Virginia master needed to ensure further labor from his white servants in order to place his investments and land improvements on a more secure basis. He, therefore, falsely accused a number of his servants of a conspiracy, quote, to run out of the colony and enticing divers others to be actors in the same conspiracy, unquote. As a result of his accusation, the alleged runaways were severely whipped and had their term of forced labor lengthened and additional seven years to be served in irons. Now, Yahweh's law would not have allowed that either, because first off, by two or three witnesses may every matter be established. And were it found by competent godly judges, that this man was, in fact, lying. They would impose as strict, if not a worse penalty, on him and every other lying witness he paid off to try to steal the lives of people, specifically his own kinsmen. This can be regarded as a light sentence in view of the fact that seven years was a standard addition of the term of labor for the crime of running away or conspiring to do so, to which would then be added, in terms of additional time, the expenses incurred for capture and return of the white to his master, such costs being likely to include rewards, sheriffs and slave hunters' bounties, and jail fees. Again, Yahweh's laws would not allow for this, not to anyone. These latter were not fixed by law until 1726 and were a source of tremendous abuse by tacking on huge costs to the capture of the runaway and then commanding that the runaway pay for these inflated costs in terms of years of his life and further forced labor. 
A white slave who fled or was accused of fleeing often had his term of labor extended seven, ten, or even fifteen years. As a result, white slave Lawrence Finney received an additional seven years, eleven months of forced labor for running away, while escaped white slave William Fisher on being caught, received an additional term of six years and 250 days. Petitions, Chester County, Pennsylvania, Court of Quarter Sessions, August 1731 and June 1732, just for being absent from the plantation at any time. A white slave would be forced to undergo one additional year of slavery for every two hours he was absent from beckles white servitude page 84 starving white slaves who took extra food from their masters overflowing larders were enslaved another two years for each commission of that crime in quotes punishment of runaway white slaves Virginia 1643, quote, Whereas these are divers, loitering, runaways in the colony who very often absent themselves from their master's servant. service, be it therefore enacted and confirmed that all runaways shall be absent themselves from their said master's service, shall be liable to make satisfaction by service at the end of their time of indenture double the time of service so neglected and in some cases more if the commissioners for the place find it requisite and convenient from henning's statutes at large volume one two fifty four and two fifty five with the emphasis uh, supplied further accusations infractions and violations added to these additions and in some amounted to a lifetime of total enslavement and not the allegedly limited benign white indentured servitude the professorcrats fleetingly refer to on their way to their semester-long devotion to negro slave studies indeed one half of white indentured servants in quotes did not live to attain their freedom should anyone think this grim datum refers mainly to whites enslaved in old age it actually refers to whites who were first indentured between the ages of sixteen one six and twenty breidenbaugh page one twenty three the truth is wrote white slave edward hill we live in the fearfulest age that ever Christians lived in. And incidentally, now that I am stopping off here, uh, I won't be picking up with uh, enslavement of white family, uh, the white family, until next time. But incidentally, the scripture quoted by Michael Hoffman, I was curious about. So I went to Leviticus 25.45. Now, after saying quite a bit concerning the way that you are to treat your brother, as in your fellow Hebrew, your fellow Israelite, there are different ways that you are to treat your brother who is native in the land and a racial alien who comes into your land or from other countries just gonna read it to you this isn't me this is Yahweh God Almighty is making these proclamations he says and I'll read it in more plain English moreover of the children of the aliens who live among you of them you may buy and of their families who are with you which they have conceived in your land and they will be your property you may make them an inheritance for your children after you to hold for a possession of them may you take your slaves forever 
but over your brothers, the children of Israel, you shall not rule one over another with harshness. And Yahweh goes on after that to say more about how we are to be with our brothers. <sighs> so, to add on insult to injury, not only did all of this prolific white slavery happen, far more in abundance than any black slavery in the colonies, Moreover, what was done from one white man to another far exceeds the breaking of Yahweh's law than what didn't happen as en masse to the Negro slave. You see, it's allowable by the law of Yahweh to take slaves of those who are racial aliens in the land as a permanent slave it is not allowable to mistreat them get that straight it is not allowable to mistreat them but it is allowable to take them as a permanent slave and pass them on and their families from one to another and you would say why why would that be? Well, that would not be if that land were to be living under the law of Yahweh and serving Yahweh. And of course today, having the testimony of his Messiah and only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Then it would not be that way. Then they would be our brothers when we could not treat them in the same way as an alien. But Yahweh's law does allow that. So you see, the treatment of all these whites by whites was a far more grievous sin than the treatment of the Negroes, who, as we've seen so far, were treated better than the whites anyways at least by the whites. I don't know how they were treated by their kinsmen back in Africa. Probably not too good. To this day, they aren't treated too well by their kinsmen in Africa. <clears throat> so that'll do it for another reading of Michael Hoffman's They Were Whites and They Were Slaves. Next time I'll pick up with the enslavement of the white family. And that should be very interesting. So I hope this is empowering and food for thought. And until next time, read your Bible. Repent of your sinful ways. Turn to Yahweh to keep his law. Not that it should provide you with salvation, for it is Christ who is salvation. But Yahweh's law is good. Study it. Understand. Be good especially to the household of the faith, and to every man do well. <laughs>